Welcome to A Game of Ice and Fire, a video series devoted to A Song of Ice and Fire war game by Cool Mini or Not. We cover all aspects of the hobby with tactics and list build videos, painting tutorials of varying levels, and battle reports. In this video we're going to be painting some Lannister Guard. Now I'm going to be painting them in the uh, scheme that matches the box art or the concept art for these guys. Uh, the show's uh, color scheme or, art or armor style that they've got is really intriguing and I might do another unit of Lannister Guard like that just to mix it up. I do think it looks really cool this dark metallic color with a really deep red crimson but I really want these to stand out on the table and the uh, box art really lends itself to that. This is a pretty long painting tutorial the reason for that is that I've always said at the beginning of these videos that we do painting tutorials of varying levels, and I haven't really varied that level at all with the painting tutorials. So in this one, I'm going to be just cranking it up a little bit to get these models looking a little bit better than tabletop. So hopefully you can pick up some new skills with this video, and uh, if not, just uh, check out how I do things. And uh, we are doing, uh, we are starting the models out two different ways. We're going to be airbrushing the beginning of one of them and then dry brushing the other one just so that those who don't have an airbrush uh, can at least have a direction to take with uh, these models. Here we are with our two Lannister Guard. Now for the airbrushing, I'm going to use uh, the Vallejo Metal Colors. I think these are some of the best metals on the market for airbrushing or painting. Um, uh, gun Metal is a good one to start off with if you're gonna you're getting into like the directional highlighting on this one. Uh, spraying at like a 45 degree angle ish. I uh, just want to get leave some of that black behind and catch the higher parts of it with the dark metal and now I'm coming in at not quite a 90 degree a 90 degree angle because I want to uh, get more of the reflective metal or this the bright metal on top just to make them look nice and shiny. Now for the uh, dry brushing I'm gonna be moving over to the scale 75 uh, paints because uh, the Vallejo metal colors are really nice, but they don't dry brush very well. So we've got the same black base coat uh, on this model, and we're going to come in with um, black metal first. Now, I, when I'm dry brushing, I like to get it to just about uh, that consistency or what, what's left on the paper towel, so I'm not dragging a bunch of wet paint around. And I am just uh, dry brushing in a downward motion. I'm not, I know it looks like I'm flicking back and forth, but I'm really only touching that model when I'm going in the downward motion to try and uh, simulate that airbrush effect that I've got. It's not going to be perfect, nowhere near going to look the same, but uh, you can see we've kind of got this really dark base coat going on. So now we're going to switch over into the heavy metal from scale 7.5. This is going bright, to brighten it up for us. Uh, a little bit more. Now in hindsight when I took a look at these models when I was done with them I think uh, you probably would be better off um, starting off with maybe a, a brighter uh, metal for the base coat instead of just black because there is a really marked difference between the airbrushing that I did with the, uh, the first Lannister Guard and this one. So I originally was just going to stop at this uh, um, heavy metal, but I decided to break out um, scale 75's speed metal and brighten it up just a little bit more. You can see there's a big difference between the two just because the airbrush, uh, the airbrush lighter color just translates better that way. So we're going to continue the rest of the tutorial um, with the airbrushed one. But now you can see I'm coming in to brighten up the uh, the the lamp the dry brushed Lannister, <laughs> Lannister guard. <laughs> um, this gets them a little bit closer to looking similar-ish, but I really like the bright metal on these, which is why I didn't wash the metal afterwards. Uh, a, a, a black wash will dull down the metal a little bit. If you thin it down, you can get it to just go to the recesses and look decent that way, but I do want this metal to be super bright and uh, any kind of recesses I can paint later. So we're going to start out with the skin tone first. We've got Tindalos Red, Ishtar Pink, and then Harvester Flesh from uh, Scale 75 Fantasy uh, Colors. I just ordered this set uh, over, well, I got it at Adepticon, paid for it at Adepticon, but then there was a 
mix up in the shipping information. So I finally just got this. I have a few of their sets and love them. So I'm kind of jumping in with some with these paints. Some of them I haven't tried out yet, so we're just going to see how they pan out. The base coat for the skin tone is a one-to-one-ish mix of the Ishtar Pink and Tindalos Red. Um, I think that uh, Tindalos Red is just a nice way to get a, a good dark base coat in the skin tone. Uh, so now I'm going to come back in after having covered the model with uh, just straight uh, Ishtar Pink. And uh, with this one, what I'm intending to do is leave a lot of the the Tindalos mix behind and just really pick out a lot of the details that are on the face. Um, as opposed to the, uh, the Stark Sworn Swords from the starter box, the Lannister Guard actually have a pretty well detailed face. Like you can, you don't have like that weird potato look that one of them has going on. But uh, we're just going to be picking out the nose mostly, uh, the cheekbones, and with the way that the helmets angled on these guys, we're going to grab the uh, the chin and the a little bit of the jawline along the bottom. But those are that's really where we're going to center in, just blocking in this color. Uh, I'm not going to get too crazy with trying to uh, blend those tones together. I really just want to have the shadows of that Tindalos red mix uh, hanging behind. Uh, some other ways you can start the base for faces would be with a a, a greenish color. So you can, I think, uh, if you're trying to go for like more of an olive skin tone, uh, and then I've, I've used purple a lot too, but with that one looks a little, uh, otherworldly, but it's still a, a neat way to, to, um, shift the, the base coat of them. So now I'm mixing in a little bit of the harvester flesh into the Ishtar pink. The harvester flesh isn't, uh, isn't a really super bright skin tone, but it's bright enough to where the, the jump from Ishtar Pink to Harvester Flesh is a pretty uh, harsh one. So I'm just trying to mix them together to where the progression looks a little bit easier. This is kind of like, I think, what a lot of people would consider like more classic layering in that I'm just slowly stepping the colors up without really blending them so that when you uh, are looking at them, and this isn't like your three foot distance type uh, tabletop good. I mean, you can get pretty close to these guys, and then the uh, transition with those, just be based on the way the color is, um, isn't too stark. Like you're uh, you're stepping up the progression of the colors at a really like in really small increments. So we've got the the nose and everything highlighted. So now we're moving on to the red parts of the uh, um, stupid <laughs> Lannister guard. Uh, I started out the base coat with. Uh, let me see what this one's called. Blood uh, Bloodfest Crimson. Now, when I first picked this color up, I had thought that it was going to be a little bit more of a deep red. And as I'm painting it on the model, it started to come out more purpley, which I'm not opposed to. Um, I think that the, the purplish color is is uh, not a bad way to start out red. Um, it definitely can end up with you can end up with a much more bold red by starting out with a purple base coat or a purple-ish base coat because you can do things like start with black or start with uh, a brownish red which I've done in the past especially with my umber berserkers but with the Lannister guard uh, you kind of want them to look a little bit more um, regal I guess or just a little bit more um, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for but just kind of more uh, important or fancy. So we're just going around with uh, all of that Bloodfest Crimson. And with the way the these metals work, and I, you probably won't experience this as much with the dry brushed ones, you end up having to go through a couple times after the base coat dries because, uh, first of all, I paint in thin layers anyways when I'm doing things like this. But um, more so with the uh, 
beginning the base coat or beginning the metals as the first uh, the first thing I paint on them. A lot of those metallic colors uh, shine through the uh, the layers of paint that you're putting on. They're not super thick, um, which is why you can see me going over the uh, um, going over parts certain parts of the armor or the shield, like the the gold trim and everything like that, because I do want to try and start blocking out that. Uh, I want to try and start blocking out those colors early as opposed to uh, having to do it later with the um, uh, with the brown or gold that I'd be putting on there. Now, just before we get too, uh, too deep into the process of what's going to be coming up next here, um, I'm really just jamming the color in to establish the base coat for the red. But after this, we're going to start doing... I, I'm, I'm not sure what anyone would call it, maybe like a, it's almost like glazing, but um, I wouldn't quite call it that. It's more so like layering with a weird intention. So um, a lot of people focus on brushes, right? Like what's the best brush to have? So right here, I'm just using like one of my workhorse brushes. I get these things on Amazon for super cheap. And they, they pound color really well. They hold paint fine. And they they stand up to the abuse of base coating things and even spreading around dirt and grit. But some of the more fine brushes, they have the the characteristics of the bristles. Um, is really uh, They're really prone to manipulation. So when someone gets a good brush, they might not know why it's good. And what I'm going to be doing here is um, splaying out my brush hairs to kind of coat with uh, a thin layer of paint but then have the paint collect while I'm getting towards the bottom of where I want to paint and uh, I've used um, a little bit of the crimson bl or the blood fest crimson that we had before and I'm mixing in a little bit of uh, I believe the color is called mayhem red um, and I've gotten it to not super thin consistency like we're not talking like super opaque or transparent um, this is uh, you can still see the color uh, when it goes down on the model but since we've mixed those two colors we're already kind of making the transition easier for us but what my goal here is when I'm painting is not to pack color onto the model what I want to try and do here is put a little bit of pressure on the uh, on the on the brush when I when I hit the model so you see me getting rid of a little bit of paint here I want to put a little bit of pressure with the with the brush to start letting some of the paint flow but then I'm going to be um, dragging that line out to where the direction of the highlight would be and then uh, pulling off so what that's going to do is leave a like a thin line of paint where I've where I've been dragging the bristles and then as I pull off, it's going to be depositing a little bit more paint onto that area so that the highlight um, kind of comes through a little bit more. There's a little bit more concentration of the paint or pigment on that area that I'm pulling off. And uh, it sounds kind of funky when I'm doing this with uh, um, multiple colors because you would think that the one that I'm doing next would block out the other one. But that's why I'm kind of, I'm not doing these in a really um, sweeping motion. It's more of, I'm kind of going back and forth over it to try and build up that layer, but then still have some of the, uh, the concentration of the paint that I'm putting on deposited in a way to where I'll be able to leave some behind with the... Uh, uh, with the next color that I end up going to. Now on this little plume or whatever feather thing that's stuck on their head, um, I'm getting a little more... Uh, I'm not getting very detailed with uh, how that highlight's going to go. Um, that's where most of the light is going to be hitting them. So uh, the, the more detailed highlights to pick out like the little creases in the feather or whatever 
um, those are going to be a little bit more controlled when I get to like my final highlight color. Right now, the, the bulk of the light's going to be hitting right on top there, so I know that I'm going to be needing to use... Uh, uh, I, I don't need to be um, super accurate with how those uh, highlights work out. So you can see now the, the thing... The trick with red, red is always one of those colors that people seem to say they, they hate painting or they can't paint it well. Um, in my opinion, I think red's one of the better colors to paint or easier ones to paint because uh, most of the red paints out there have a pretty uh, transparent or opaque, I guess, quality to them where it just takes a little bit longer to build up the pigment on them. I, I'm not sure exactly what it is with reds in particular, why this is such a problem, but they uh they they're kind of a little bit more see-through when you work with them uh so you if you can build up the layers it's almost like you're you're being helped by how the red paint actually works because uh you can see some of the red underneath some of the red that you put on before underneath the layer that you're putting on now so they kind of easily just blend themselves together so i'm working now with uh the this might maybe i have my colors mixed up i i think this might be the ball crimson is what i had mixed in with the uh um with the uh blood fest crimson i'm i'm not i can't remember quite quite off the top of my head and i didn't catch it on the screen so maybe you can it's one of those two it's either mayhem red or ball crimson but this red seems to deposit itself more on my finger than it does on the model for whatever reason. So I'm going to juice up the, the paint a little bit more with some more of the thinner that I, that I use. Because um, you can see it's, it's going down nicely on my fingers, but once I hit the model here, it's having a really hard time leaving the brush and getting onto the, onto the mini. Um, and I don't think it's because I have it too thick. But now you can see that um, I'm getting it to come through a little bit more, and this is where um, you can really start to see some of that uh, leaving a thin layer of paint behind start to take effect. Um, that red is super bright, but it's not uh, screaming out loud on the model yet because I haven't properly built up the layers enough to really get it to, to really come alive and pop on that model. So we're just going to keep working... Uh, back and forth on the model until we can get the red to kind of look where look how I want it to. Um, in my original goal when I started with uh, with this is I really did want to make a pretty bombastic red um, on the Lannister, but for some reason I just always end up painting a little bit more of a darker deep red. So um, that's kind of the direction we're going right now. I'm not trying to. I'm like kind of letting the model and the paint take me where it wants to, you know, like to get, you know, tree huggy about it. Um, the paints are not paints that I've, some of these colors I haven't worked with before. I've worked with the Scale 75 Fantasy line a lot, just not their reds or some of their other ones, like their greens and blues, but their skin tones are, have been really cool. So, so far I'm enjoying everything that I've done so far on this model, but this particular color is one that I think I'm going to need a little bit more time with in order to get the gist of. Um, a good replacement for this color if you're uh, not as patient as I am and uh, and don't want to futz with what's going on with this red. Um, Mephiston red from Games Workshop is a really great red to re replace itself for this color specifically. Um, it's just heavily pigmented. It goes on nice um in terms of like if you were to thin this thin mephiston red down it just it doesn't feel like you're losing a whole lot with it um the gw foundation pa paints in general are just really good if you're having uh a little bit of a diff little bit of a difficult time with those um troublesome colors like red or yellow um and i from what I've seen from some of the other foundation paints, like I, I don't really care too much for the black that they have, um, and the blue is just not a color that I appreciate, not that hue of it, but the red, and then I can't, I think it's, I want to say it's like Tau Seti or something like that. Um, you can see me hitting that bottle a lot, uh, 
and it really is because the um the the lights that i'm using uh that i have picked up for battle reports are really just baking the the paint that i've uh been putting onto these palettes so i've got to work a little bit quicker or the paint gets a little bit more gummy than what i would appreciate but i don't want to water it down too much right away um because uh then it just gets hard to work with in the beginning part and you're really just trying to save yourself some time with the in the long run when i just want to try and use it right away so uh, you probably won't have as many issues uh with this as i have but whatever i guess um, one of the things that you had seen me do just a minute ago is uh, I used the back of my finger to get some of the excess paint off. But um, when you draw your brush back and then spin the, the brush in your hand, you can reform the point on your brush. And I'm doing that to try and get uh, more pinpointed highlights, especially on the arms when they've got their little, I don't know what you would call them, their, their vented sleeves or whatever. And right there on my thumb, I decided to push flat against my my skin. And not just to get some of the excess paint off, but I also wanted to flatten the bristles out so that I could uh, get some of this like weird feathering, layering thing going on. Uh, I'm not a classically trained artist, so I'm not sure what the actual terms are of what I'm doing. I just do them. Um, so the color that I'm mixing in with... Uh, that um, mayhem red or or bale red or whatever is a uh, behent red. Uh, I'm not sure exa or beharit red. Yeah, sorry. The words on these paint bottles are pretty tiny. Um, so it's more of like an orangey red. And there's always a problem that comes when you mix orange with red to try and brighten it up. For some reason, it kind of heads towards the pink side. So if you can find one of these oranges, that's a little bit more. Uh, tilted to the red side, you can uh, make sure that that transition or that mix is going to look a little bit better. Uh, for whatever reason, I'm I'm not sure. Maybe it's the certain paints I've been purchasing before, but uh, mixing a little bit of orange and red together just gives me this really pinky salmon looking color. And uh, what I'm getting out of this one, I am uh, enjoying quite a bit in terms of like what the results are with it. So here you, this is where I'm going to be getting a little bit more uh, accurate with my highlighting. Uh, I made sure to hit the big plume on the top or the big fold in that feather first. Um, and then from there I was hitting the lines with the, uh, that are on the feather so that I could get a little bit more of a, a neater look to it. Now this particular model has a, a large portion of it shield pointed down. So you probably wouldn't get as high of a or as strong of a highlight on these as I'm putting on them. But I just really wanted to show how um, working around that lion, uh, that, that embossed lion, embossed, yeah, lion is, uh, is working out for me. So um, you've just seen me uh, over highlight with the orange on that shield. So I had come back in with just my straight um, mayhem red and kind of bring it back down a little bit to normal so it wasn't too out of the line. So now I'm going back just over some random parts and kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel what's left there so that I can get some of these edges of their little vented sleeve things and uh, just a few folds um, to make sure that I'm getting the, uh, the most out of my highlights. So again, um, I wanted to try and go for a little bit more bombastic and cartoony red but instead I've kind of ended up with a little bit more I don't know it feels just a little bit more tame with the red but we're going to be doing things to this model to try and make that stand out a little bit more try and use a little bit of like color theory to try and uh, make this model pop a little bit more so now we're going to move on to the, uh, the the browns and these ones I can't remember their names for crap and I guess I don't have as good eyesight as uh, my my glasses would lead me to think. Uh, the the base coat that I'm starting with right now is Arbuckle Brown, and this one is uh, it actually is a little bit more pointed to the purple side of the brown. So you can get like these like black blackish browns or purpley browns. And when I first looked at the bottle, 
I wasn't quite sure what I was going to get. It looked like it was going to be more towards the black-brown side. And then it ended up coming out purpley-brown, which I'm okay with. Um, we're kind of like headed in this monotone direction. But again, we're going to try and use some tricks to make it not look so washed out. Um, I also hit the, uh, the sword uh, handle and hilt, pommel, what, whatever. I'm not a, I'm not savvy on sword terms. So the part that you hold that protects your hand. <laughs> um, I hit that with the brown because I hadn't come back. I, I didn't get it with the red or anything. So I want to try and take away the shine for when I end up putting gold on over it because I am going to make the sword handles gold for them. And to make my life a little bit easier when I get to the uh, gold on the shield, I'm going to take some brown and uh, and go over all the parts that I want to hit here that will be turned gold. Um, if you are having problems painting gold, this is the best way to solve those problems. I mean, other than unless you're using like a really bummy gold or something. Um, make sh You can go around... Um, your gold portions and before you try to put those metallics on just hit it with brown it'll give you a nice uh, base to work with and if your gold is a little too transparent you at least have some uh, brown color under it to kind of simulate the, the the shadow of gold right so now we're moving on to um, the next brown up which is um, it looks like it's Bosch Chestnut is what it's called. So this is where I'm going to get the bulk of the highlighting done on that uh, Arbuckle Brown. And uh, I'm not going uh, too um, nutty with this one. The uh, the brown, I think I've uh, like maybe overthinned it a little bit in terms of like what I'm trying to achieve here. When it comes to like the bigger parts of the model, like the uh, the red that we've worked with, and parts of these boots it works okay on. Um, it's all right to have that paint a little bit thinner because you're going to just try and build those layers up and um, make those transitions happen that way. Um, much like how I had done with the red, you can still do that with only one paint where uh, you can see I'm kind of going over areas multiple times here so that I can take the that really transparent brown layer that I had put on fir on the first pass and then just reinforce it in the right areas uh, with another pass of that uh, transparent brown color. Um, so I'm not really trying to get the the super stark, um, like hard lines uh, with the with thinning down this paint a little bit a little bit beyond what I should. Because you can see even on the palette there, you can see through the brown into the green a little bit that existed underneath it. So now we're going in with the the final highlight color called uh, Kokum Copper. I'm not I'm sure that these are words that mean something to someone, but I mean I know what copper means, but Kokum, I'm not sure. Um, this is just a really stark highlight that's going to really pull a lot of attention. Um, so I've got it thinned down a little bit uh, further than what I would if I were just trying to pack color in. Um, you can kind of see as I'm rubbing the, or as I'm getting the excess paint off on my thumb, you can still see through to a lot of the red that's underneath it. Uh, and we're just going to be going over uh, parts several times to do the same thing we're doing with the, uh, the, the previous brown. Um, just building up the layers to try and make a smooth transition to make those belts just uh, look present, you know. Um, these models are small. And we do want people to see the discernible details on them. But we, for this particular model, I'm also trying to do things a little bit more um, refined or uh, um, just trying to make them look a little bit more uh, smooth. So by building up these really small layers, uh, we're going to achieve that. Uh, the last bit of the um, Kokum copper that I have is going to go into uh, the the ch the lion on this uh, guard's chest. Um, the uh, the cloth material 
I want to try and do uh, like a this lighter brown into uh, yellow um, just to simulate that gold clothing. Um, I don't really like putting straight metallics onto clothing at all, but you can make it look gold-ish with, uh, I, I know some people call it non, or most people would call it non-metallic metals, but that's really not what I'm trying to do here. I'm just trying to make gold the cloth color. And I'm going to use these other two yellows here. I think the brightest one, well, uh, the yellow yellow is uh, Marduk yellow. And then the uh, the really, like, pale yellow is Lilith yellow. And we're just going to go in and slightly touch some of the parts of the, uh, the lion um, just to get some highlights going with the, uh, the Marduk yellow. Um, I'm, not, I'm not being super uh, attentive to the details of the lion on this one. If I, uh, if I had, I could just go back and try and make it actually look like it's something other than just a yellow blotch on their shirt. But um, like I said, we're just kind of taking this to just barely above um, a, a tabletop standard. I'm not wanting to sit here and paint uh, 36 uh, or 39 uh, Lannister Guard with, uh, with this amazingly detailed lion on their chests um, when people will just be cursing at them anyways. So I'm going to get the sheath, or the sheath or the scabbard of the sword. Um, the thing that holds the sword when you're not using it. Um, and I'm going to do that in black just so that it stands out a little bit more, kind of breaks the model up a little bit. Right now we've got a lot of, uh, a lot of red going on between the, the brown being tilted more towards that red-purple, um, and most of the model is covered in red anyways. So this black is just going to give us a nice hard dark line uh, that'll stand out on the model itself. Um, and this is where we're going to start getting into uh, using the color wheel to trick things. Uh, one thing I'm going to do here real quick to interrupt myself is just hard line the inside edge of this shield to give it a nice, a nice cut shadow. Um, if you were trying to separate lines without washing, this is how you would do it. But that's the only d place I decided to apply that, uh, that technique, I guess. So now we're switching over to... Uh, uh, I think they call this one um, Raye Gray. Now I know that um, the if you insert an L in there, it's very uh, Lovecraftian, but this particular bottle of paint does not have that consonant in there, so it's Raye Gray. Um, this is a more uh, bluish gray, and what we're trying to do is get up to that teal with the in's mouth gray that I have sitting out there, and that's going to give us like this weird um, sharp interplay with the way the colors are because red and green contrast each other. So when you put them together, they, they really stand out like a, a million sore thumbs. So I'm trying to subtly get some of that uh, to stand out. And I think um, when all is said and done here, I got a little on the timid side with that highlight to where it didn't really stand out as much as I wanted it to. Um, so if this is something you're wanting to try and employ, I would just try and turn it up a notch. Um, but those are the, the small things you can do to try and combat having too much of one color on a model, is just figure out which color contrasts with it and throw it on there to try and, uh, or, or at least integrate it in a decent way. Don't Just don't throw it on there. Um, so now we're going to start with the gold, and again, I'm picking up the, the scale color golds. Um, I'm going to start out with a base of Viking gold, progress up to dwarven gold, and then finally highlight everything with elven gold. Now, this metal uh, waters down real well, and with the first coat, I am going to, uh, uh, to thin that one down a little bit. I don't want the the base coat to get too too thick in the recesses to where it starts blocking out a lot of the details, especially on that embossed lion that I'm working on, and then again on the shield. Um, with that brown underneath, uh, we've got a nice base coat to work with to where we really only have to make a pass or two with the, uh, the Viking gold. And uh, normally when I work on metals, I like to leave a little bit of the... Uh, 
flat or matte color, the, the regular color behind the non-metallic color to give the shadow. Because when you look at shadowed metal, um, the shadows aren't all reflective. There's like the, a solid color that exists there where no light's hitting it and you're not getting any reflective properties. Uh, but with this one, I really want this gold to look super shiny. Like this is, this is going to be a, a super rich gold. So covering the entire base coat of those metals, uh, of those metal parts with the metal is what I want to do. So this next part I'm going through is the dwarven gold. And you notice that I didn't water it down. And the reason why is that I, this metal is, it's not that it's super thin when you get it, but what it does flow off the brush really well without having to thin it down. And I really want to control it. Um, those recess, it, the, the raised details on this shield are, uh, they're not perfect. They're, they're, there are some parts where you, you just really want the brush control on it. And uh, I can get that without having to water it down. Now it dries faster, but it also doesn't help that I've got like uh, 1200 LEDs baking it. Um, oftentimes you get to listen to people say like the cardinal thing about miniature painting is always thin your paint down to a skim milk consistency. That is like the worst thing I think I've ever heard. I mean, other than let's paint with toothpaste. But the thing is, you have to understand how each paint behaves. You can't just put this blanket statement down that says, all paint needs to be thinned down to this consistency. It needs to be a one-to-one -one ratio or a two-to-one ratio. Each paint behaves in a very different way. They're not all formulated the same. So pay attention to your paints. Just get the, get the gist of what the consistency is and let the paint tell you how thin it needs to be for what you need to do. Because you might want to do something like block in a bunch of color or you might want to control uh, hard lines like I'm doing with these paints. Um, I don't need to thin these paints down to do that, and thinning it down is only going to make my life more difficult. So uh, don't think that there's a surefire way, the one true way that you need to thin your paints down or paint. Um, just listen to what's going on with your paint. I know I'm, I'm getting a little like metaphysical here. Um, with this painting tutorial, but it's really just one of those things where you got to feel it out and figure out what you're going to do. Um, like with this Elven Gold, this paint is phenomenal for being able to be controlled by not thinning it. So I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to put any water in this thing at all. And you can see the highlights I'm getting. They're nice and sharp. They're super bright and packed with tons of color. This gold is reflecting like crazy. So when someone comes into this unit and starts attacking it, you're like, it's not the Lannister Supremacy. The Lannister Supremacy is like the shininess of the gold in their armor. That's why people are taking saves, because they can't see anything. Or at least that's one theory, right? So uh, one detail that I had missed was uh, the belt buckle. So I'm just coming in here and putting a little bit of black down, and then I'm going to go straight to the heavy metal instead of using black metal. There's just not enough on that, uh, not enough, like, uh, surface area on that belt buckle for me to want to try and highlight it further. And then I did realize that I missed like the little pants that are sticking out from under him. So I'm just doing it in black and not really going in and highlighting it at all. Um, they're just really not important. It at least breaks up the model a little bit and makes them look at least somewhat unfashionable, right? Because they're wearing black pants and brown shoes. So doing the base now, I'm using some junky department store acrylic paint and I don't thin this down much I only put a little bit of water in it to just kind of get it to mix around a little bit but if you start thinning this stuff down to like how you would thin down a paint normally um, it just doesn't the pigment just goes dead in it um, and you can see I, I made a little bit of a boo-boo on the palette and that I had some of that ends mouth teal left over and uh, mixed it into the brown uh, I'm not too worried about it. Uh, it's still going to get the same effect. There's so much of the apple, apple barrel paint that uh, it's not going to matter. And here's what the base looks like dry. So we're going to go in and dry brush with Vallejo Game Color's Beastie Brown. And then do a final dry brush with Vallejo Game Color's Khaki. And uh, the base for this model, or the flock for the dirt... Um, is uh, Vallejo's uh, earth texture. It's like an acrylic paste. 
you paint it on the miniature and it's got grit to it so once it dries it's kind of got this really nice uh texture to it and it's really strong too i think i have a whole video on how to apply this stuff and what the benefits of it are versus uh, just gluing dirt down um, and I'm coming in here with a pretty, I started out with a light dry brush because I didn't know r really where I wanted to go with it. And then I just ended up uh, thickening it up and b making a heavier dry brush along this thing so that I could really start to uh, make the dirt look a little bit more fertile. Um, I think I might have said this in one of my previous videos, but I oftentimes am painting the base on these models uh, in the... Uh, um, like the terrain where they're from at least or not where they're from but where they're currently at in the story so like i kind of go with the the lannisters as being a, a little further down south where i mean i'm i don't know if i don't think king's landing the or the the, the king's landing area is like super uh fertile or anything but probably not as snowy and gross as it is up north um now we're just going in with the khaki this one's a little bit lighter uh just to um, really pick out the uh, fine detail of that uh, uh, Vallejo paste that uh, dries up. So you can kind of see here while I'm dry brushing it, but where I've dragged the brush when I initially put on the, uh, the earth texture, it just gets this really nice inconsistent look and makes it look real natural. So it's just a, a really cool way to get some nice looking uh, texture bases. So I've had these grasses forever. Um, I'm picking up two here so I can try and blend some of them on the base, which um, there's not a whole lot of room for me for me to do that, so I get what I get out of it. But um, typically, no matter what game I'm playing, uh, I will always I, I always base things in snow. I like doing frozen stuff. So grass isn't something that I use a lot. I know I can get like cheaper and more uh, varied options from other suppliers um, just as a quick heads heads up I, I just use regular Elmer's glue to apply this stuff you don't need to get too um, too involved with the type of glue you're using on here and I'm just gonna paint that on in the areas where I want the grass to stick and typically I'm when I do grass bases I'll leave a lot of the dirt behind just to make it look a little bit more patchy and uh, uh, war torn like people have been stamping their feet around a bunch but to get back to what I was saying earlier um, I've had these grasses for a really long time so uh, if you have something else that works better for you go for it uh, as you can see with me having the hemostats out I do not uh, utilize static grass applicators um, I just don't think it's worth my time I don't make uh, terrain boards or anything like that so I just stick this on the base and it looks grassy enough to me without standing at full attention so um, it, it works when I do it this way for me so uh, I'm not trying to get super um, accurate with the way the grass is standing on here so um, we'll let this dry a little bit and see if my blending kind of panned out for me so um, the blending kind of worked a little bit too well in some areas and that the the step grass that I have from uh, uh, Army Painter is almost uh, really ma matching the uh, the brown that I painted the base too well and uh, now I'm doing that trademark uh, black lip base uh, for whatever reason I decided to do things backwards and uh, I will usually do this before I put on any flock because uh, some of that grass might uh, um, be a little loose and get painted into the base and I don't really like the way that it looks when you've got a little uh, a little shard of grass just sticking out in your nice uh, satin black finished base. Um, so like I said, whatever for whatever reason I did this backwards but I would paint the black rim first if you're going to paint a black rim at all. I think they frame the model really well, especially on this one because there's so many colors going on with it. The Starks are very monotone. They've got this grayish blue um, uh, cloak on them. They've got uh, the silvers that are more towards that gray color. 
and uh, they don't really have any gold or anything like that. The skin tone is probably the most where they vary, but on these Lannister Guard, you can see there's a lot of neat color going on on this guy, and it's going to make it a, the whole unit look really impressive once they hit the table. If you've made it this far, I appreciate you watching it all the way through to the end. I know this was a long one, uh, but I think we hit on some really uh, interesting techniques on here, even if I didn't s explain them the best. Uh, if you have any questions or want me to elaborate further on those, leave uh, your questions in the comments below. Uh, you can also uh, go over to our Facebook page at Big Top Gaming and uh, post questions there. Send me a message directly to that page, and I'll be more than happy to respond to you there as well. Uh, look forward to more of these painting tutorials. I'm ha I have a ton of fun making them, and I feel like every single one I make gets a little bit better than the last one. So... Uh, thanks for watching.